And welcome in. Late kick on the air. It is Thursday night, April 8th, the year of our Lord, 2021, fresh off the Masters. A nice little lead in for us on the show tonight. We have got a jam packed college football Thursday evening for you. A couple of housekeeping notes. Going to mention them right after I tell you what's coming up. We don't talk a lot of NFL draft here. It's a college football show. It's not really an NFL draft show. However, sometimes uh, if you do the Venn diagram of that audience and the draft audience, sometimes there's a little bit of overlap. I think we have some overlap tonight. Touched on Justin Fields the other night, for example. Not talking about Fields tonight. I wanted to talk about Mac Jones, Alabama quarterback. Depending on which mock draft, the mock community out there, depending on which one you listen to, could go as high as third, th not third round, third overall in this upcoming draft. I'm not going to do my analysis on that. What I am going to do, just talk about how insane that concept is, and I'm going to graphically back it up. We'll have something a little bit later for you as to how if we were to go back to 2017 and I were to say that to you, you would have slapped me. Front hand and back hand, you would have slapped me for even suggesting such things. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to bring you a whole bunch of spring intel whispers. Uh, our Florida fans didn't like that we didn't touch on them last two nights, so we're going to touch on them tonight. Also, I need to go above and beyond at LSU. I want to do a specific deeper dive on the quarterback situation there and how it permeates into the whole program, as these quarterback depth charts often do. But if everyone wants to paint this as a make-or-break year for Ed Orgeron, Make or break year for LSU. Uh, I, sometimes that's that's hyperbolic, a little bit overrated. Maybe it's not this year, but it's going to be tied to quarterback. And if you're a believer that LSU's car is about to just plummet straight off a cliff, it's going to have to be in spite of the quarterback situation because they got a really, really good one. Maybe one of the best ones, not only in the SEC, maybe just the country overall. So I'm going to discuss that. And I'm going to talk about some of the games this fall uh, Brad Crawford and the guys, really a lot of folks over, I've seen Dean do some for the Big 12 over on the desk side of 24-7, doing a lot of spotlight games for various conferences this fall. I'm going to do some of the SEC tonight. We'll probably get to all the conferences, but I'm going to do some from the SEC tonight because there are some that are on the radar every year. There are some that are specific to a given year that you may look forward to. Like if this were 1999, Tennessee would be in like six of the top ten. Maybe Tennessee's in one of the top ten this year. But there are some games. I'm going to go down the list. There's like ten of them. And you can think right along with me. I'm just going to give you thoughts, every single one of them. Because right now we're, uh, what, early April. So by the time these happen, a lot will have passed. So we're going to discuss all that tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. Two bullet points. Keep in mind, the first one, we got over the benchmark on Instagram, told you it was coming. It has happened. So at Late Kick Josh, make sure you follow me there. We just passed 2,000. Every time we pass another 1,000, you know which mechanism kicks into effect. We've got a Late Kick Show Owners Association meeting confirmed coming up. Here's what you need to do. If you want to be a part of that, you need to email me, joshpate706 at gmail.com, or you can DM me, DM me on really Twitter or Instagram, at Late Kick Josh. All you have to do is say, I want in, and give me your email address. At that point, we'll put you in the lottery. We're going to have the lottery probably Sunday evening. So by Monday morning, if you've been selected, you'll be notified. You'll be given a Zoom link. You'll give you'll be given all the pertinent details, and then we'll have that next week, and we'll see when that comes out, but we'll set it up for sometime next week. So good job on that. Point number two, you have asked and asked and asked, so I've opened up the Zoom consultations again. Any of you interested in sports media, anybody want to start a YouTube channel, anyone want to start a podcast, anyone just looking for general advice in and around this sphere, this industry, hit me up, joshpate706 at gmail.com, and we'll set something up. All right, with that out of the way, I feel like I'm at a flea market sometimes. With that out of the way, Let's get started this evening. Mac Jones, what do you think about him right now? And then ask yourself, define what you think about Mac Jones right now. What did you think about him in 2017? Had you ever heard of him? Let me just rephrase it. Had you ever heard of Mac Jones in 2015, 16, 17? I can't get over some of these mock drafts. I look at them. I have uh, copyrighted the term mock community. I capitalize the M and the C. And I'm looking at him right now. And they don't quite look like what I thought they'd look like in 2017. So I'm looking at Mac Jones. He is a consensus first rounder, depending on where you look. Everyone's got him first round. But depending on where you look, some have him as high as number three overall to right now that would be the San Francisco 49ers. I'm not here to break down mock drafts. That's not our area of expertise. To be honest with you, many people who put him out, that's not their area of expertise either. Having said that, I just want to assume for a second for argumentative purposes Let's assume Mac Jones goes number three. Do you know how insane that would be? If we're using the revisionist history, if we're looking back on 2017, 
I, the praise is valid. So I, when I talk about how shocking or how amazing this is, I'm not saying he's overrated. I'm not doing anything like that. Mac Jones has validated everything that people are saying about him. Like he's earned the accolades. That's not what this is about. But as recently as last August, here's why I'm so amazed by it. If you, if you weren't with me and if you were ahead of the curve on this, then that's great for you. I wasn't as smart as you are. Last August, when Director Colin and I were right here doing this show, we would walk into the studio and I'd say, Colin, you know, I, I think Bryce Young's going to start at Alabama. And then, so we get a little bit later in the offseason. And Colin, I still think ultimately it's going to be Bryce Young's job. Mac Jones, he's pushing him though. And then we got into a couple of weeks of fall camp. And then I said, Colin, you know, Mac Jones is probably going to be the starter at Alabama. Eventually it'll be Bryce Young's job. But Mac Jones, man, it sounds like he's doing really good in camp. And then we get to opening week and I'm like, Colin, I, I, I think Bryce Young, at some point this year, we're going to see him, but Mac Jones has a stranglehold on that job. There's no longer any question as to who we're going to see starting. And then it was never a question again, was it? The only time you heard the name Bryce Young was is if Mac Jones stubbed his toe during a given drive or if they were up like 75 to nothing on well, some one at halftime, which, let's be honest, happened a couple of times. There was never a question. He took the job. He never relinquished it. But I want you to think about that quote. And I want you to think about the perspective that you had about Mac Jones going into the season. Imagine even going into last season, in August of last year, if I were to tell you, Mac Jones, give me a top five pick. You would have, I would have thought you were crazy, okay? I'm just going to be brutally honest with you. I would have thought you were crazy. So um, that's one of many reasons, by the way, that we don't laugh at predictions on the show. I, we don't make a ton of them. But when we make them and we have other people disagreeing with us, like if you were to tell me, you think South Carolina is going to win the SEC East this year. I think you're wrong. I wouldn't laugh at you and call you stupid. To me, that's, that's no crazier than in 2017 saying, Mac Jones, yeah, they got that Tua kid. Yeah, Jalen Hurts is already there. But I'll tell you who's going to go higher than any of them. And that's this Mac Jones kid. You know, the one who was committed to Kentucky, and then you guys got him at Alabama. Yeah, I am. Um, I think that's where he's going to end up. That would have been crazy. So never laugh at predictions because I want you to imagine this. Go back to 2017. Imagine if I were to offer you this prop bet. And the prop bet is Mac Jones will be drafted higher than the following. And I were to list five-star running back, Najee Harris, five-star linebacker, Dylan Moses, five-star quarterback, Tua Tonga Vailoa. Tua went fifth overall in the draft. If Mac goes third, I did the math. I had stats and info crunch the numbers. That's higher than fifth. So how about Tua? How about five-star wide receiver Jerry Judy? Five-star defensive back Pat Sertain? How about five-star wide receiver slash athlete Jalen Waddell? We've got Devontae Smith. We've got Henry Ruggs. And imagine if I told you, because outside of Moses, and that was due to injury, all these guys have fulfilled their immense potential. And imagine still being told Matt Jones is going to go higher in the draft than every single one of them. If he goes number three, it likely means that has happened. I want you to give me some odds on that. I hit up Brad Powers the other night, who is exceptional at this sort of thing. I don't even know if he needed a calculator. And I said, Brad, how, um, how would those odds look? What kind of number would you put on it? He would have said 200 to 1. I'd go even higher than that. I, I don't even know if you could go a number high enough. No one would have ever bet on this. I, unless you, your dad gave you 10 bucks to just play around with and said, you have to bet it on something. Yeah, maybe then. You know, maybe, maybe that's like betting uh, heads 20 straight times in the Super Bowl coin toss. Oh, well, it's not my $10 anyway. So he walked in. Just to sum up how amazing this story is, he walked in a couple of years ago, and he walked in, and Jalen was already there. But he walked in, and Tua was in that class. And he did not get there, and then Tua comes in the back door late. He didn't get there, and then Tua comes in via transfer. Tua's already in the class. And then Mac Jones says, I want some of that anyway. And it's like, I guarantee you, people around him said, um, one, two, three, four. There are five stars next to this Tua Cat's name. Yeah, that's okay. Dude, you're not going to start there. Well, I may not start as a freshman. Yeah, but you may not start, period. Oh, that's okay. And then he stuck it out. And he stayed and he competed. Then this other kid named Bryce Young comes in. And so some people, maybe even yours truly, just assume that job was ultimately going to be his. And he said, okay, that's fine. It never ran his mouth. You know, you never heard a whole lot of I'm fueled off disrespect, even if he is. You never heard a whole lot of that. You never, you never heard any kind of, um, I don't know, you never heard a lot of the stuff out of Mac Jones' mouth that you normally hear out of a lot of people's mouths. So my point is, 
I'd love to celebrate that stuff when it happens. It doesn't happen a whole lot, to be honest with you, and it's probably going to happen less and less in the transfer era. But he should be a poster child, not just for Nick Saban, but for any coach out there who's going through this every offseason and who has a quarterback room. I'll tell you, Ed Orgeron is probably going to deal with this soon. Um, a lot of these coaches who get a talented kid who's not going to start right away, they're going to deal with this soon enough of having to look a kid who is good enough to start at other places in the eye and saying, here's why you should stay. Well, it's not just theoretical. You can take Mac Jones and, you, hey, Wikipedia, that kid's name. Hey, look at this piece of paper. Look at this, what our graphics and info department printed out. This is the timeline of Mac Jones. I'm showing that to every one of the kids, quarterback and otherwise. I'm showing that to the kids on my roster. And furthermore, if I'm Steve Sarkeesian and I walk into the living room of a prospective athlete, quarterback anywhere on offense, but especially quarterback, I probably don't talk for the first 10 minutes of the visit. I probably walk in. I say, head nod, shake the hand, wave to everyone in the living room, and I say, dim the lights, and I hit the space bar, and starting a presentation on my laptop, I show what Mac Jones was when he got there and what Mac Jones is leaving there and what I did for him and what I could do for you. So congratulations to Mac Jones. I don't even know where he's going to go in the draft, but congratulations. As for this point moving forward, spring practice either concluding or working towards the spring game now at a bunch of different locations. So let's waste no time. The whispers and intel that we're hearing, I want to go to Texas. They had a little pause out there, so they're a little bit behind where other programs have been. How good is that offense going to be, I think, speaking of Steve Sarkeesian? That's probably the question on a lot of people's minds, Texas and otherwise, in year one under Steve Sarkeesian. How good is the offense going to be? Now, if you talk to anyone at Texas – or if you talk to someone who's never been to a practice there but just has some common sense, they can easily tell you, you know, he doesn't have the same kind of talent there that he did at Bama. You know, there, there ain't no Devontae Smith oh, and Jalen Waddle and John Mechie. He doesn't have that kind of talent there at Texas. Well, no one else does either. Uh, Bama probably won't have that this year. So, yes, that's a no-brainer. However, they should have something. And so Jordan Whittington is an offensive name at the receiver position, Texas pretty readily knows they can count on. Uh, Trey O'Mary is a guy that they pretty readily know they can count on. I was reading some of Chip Brown's stuff over on Horns247.com out of one of the recent practices, and those two names, he mentioned those two names. But then he kind of indicated, all right, past those two names, mm, guys really need to step up. That's kind of what I assumed we would hear. That's validating what I assumed we would hear they got to have guys step up. It's really that simple. They got to have guys step up. Because if you watch Sark's system, you know, it's great when you have the pieces. It's great. But like any other system, you got to have the pieces to make it functional. And so that's what spring is for. I, I imagine a lot of guys' heads are spinning out there. But wide receivers need to be better at Texas. Fortunately for them, again, it's just spring. And then there's this other backdrop around which everyone's spring practice is happening right now. And that's there's going to be a second wave of transfers inevitably coming after spring ball ends. So the reason I say that is, yeah, you may look right now and you may say, all right, I got one, two, and then question marks. Well, you never know what could be in Austin or who, rather. Could be in Austin in September that wasn't there right now and isn't here right now. I'm not just talking about late enrollees either. How about at Florida? Emory Jones' expectation level at quarterback. You're trying to follow up what Kyle Trask did last year. Trying to follow up offensively what Florida did last year. Well, they're not going to. Nor do I think most people down there expect them to in terms of raw production. So if you want to do better, like this is what a Florida fan looks at. Florida fan says Emory Jones is not going to throw for the exact same amount of yards, touchdowns, etc. as Kyle Trask. He's a different quarterback. It's a different skill set. Could we give up some offensive production but gain wins? Like last year, they lost four games. Could they end up doing better record-wise this year, having not done as good or nearly as good in terms of overall offensive production? Yeah, that's possible. You'll have an early season test against Alabama week three. So, yeah, that's possible. What has to happen there? Well, if you listen out of the scrimmages down at Florida, like Emory Jones' accuracy, it's not pinpoint they're not going to have any kind of precision passing game. And anyone who's expecting that and then is let down in the fall – has only themselves to blame, not Emory Jones or Dan Mullen. So let me make that crystal clear. That's not an expectation around here. But if that is an issue, or if it's just the reality, then they got to have that ground game. And that's where it's really fortuitous. That's where that running back room is really, really a good thing. Because I could name you five guys here. You could look at Nyquan Wright, 
Demarcus Bowman if he's healthy, Damian Pierce, uh, Malik Davis, Lingard, any of those guys at any given time could, could be a feature back on most teams but could end up taking over a game or giving you the 114 yards on 21 carries that you need in a game this fall. Any of those guys, I'm not saying they all are, any of them are capable of that. And so out of that group of five, you're going to get two or three, should get two or three, primetime contributors that will this fall hopefully close the gap and make up the difference for what you don't get in the passing game. So that's the fingers crossed approach at Florida right now. They're already done with spring. At North Carolina, they're not done. They got a really underrated offensive line depth situation in North Carolina. Quarterback's going to dominate the headlines there. We talked about it. We not only talked about Sam Howell, but also Drake May and why they project so well down the road and why they, along with LSU, are two programs in really good spots in terms of the future of the program because they've got quarterback figured out now and tomorrow, at least you assume. So I don't want to talk about quarterback, but I want to talk about the guys who protect that quarterback. Offensive line at North Carolina, really, really good spot right now. And I'm not just talking about the stat that you're going to see in preview magazine season because you're going to see in preview magazine season – Take offensive seri- or take offense seriously for North Carolina because they return all five starters on the offensive line. And listen, yes, I do have to look at a sheet here. Asim Richards, Josh Azuda, Brian Anderson, Marcus McKeithen, Jordan Tucker. Those are the five returning starters. If I add Ed Montalus, they have about, I think it's 113 combined <laughs> returning starts for their top six offensive linemen. You notice I mentioned six. You can go past that sixth man. You can go seven eight, nine, and arguably even 10, they've got really good depth there. If you talk to some folks at North Carolina, not only do they love their starters and certainly love quarterback, receiver, et cetera, they think they could afford to lose a couple of guys. They're not top heavy, in other words, on the offensive line, the way that 99% of college programs, are. some college programs aren't even top heavy. Some college programs have about three or four offensive linemen they think they can win with. North Carolina's got seven or eight, and really in emergency, nine or ten they think they can win with. That's atypical. Okay, so if you're trying to look for someone to push Clemson, if you're trying to look for someone to be a surprise contender on the national level, well, that's a spotlight position on what is going to be a spotlight team this year at North Carolina. And I want to go to Iowa. We haven't talked about Iowa much. Uh, The Iowa program is always cloaked in anonymity because everyone just assumes, oh, it's the same team every year. Spencer Petrus is going to be their starting quarterback this year in all likelihood, okay? So my question about Iowa is always how good can they be at quarterback because I know I'm going to get a certain style of play and level of play from Iowa. It's always good enough to be an 8-4, 9-3 caliber program and always good enough to pull an upset on anyone any given Saturday. But if they're going to be a program that gets over the hump, if they're going to be a program that threatens to play in Indianapolis, for example, it would take good quarterback play. Now, Spencer Petras had a very up-and-down season last year, came on somewhat late. So the hope amongst Iowa fans is let's bottle up what we saw really late in the season and then let's shake it up in spring and offseason and then let's uncap it and hopefully it spews into 2021 and we just go above and beyond and we overachieve at the quarterback position. Hey, I hope all that comes to fruition, but let me tell you this. Let me make it crystal clear. Uh, This was backed up by talking to someone close to the Iowa program last night. It is Spencer Petrus or quite literally bust or fizzle, in other words. Imagine shaking up that bottle and then opening it and just goes, because then you find out it's like seven years old Coke. Don't want that. So it's Spencer Petrus or bust. You know I hate peeps. You know I think peeps are Satan's candy. Here's how it was described to me. The Iowa quarterback situation was described to me as the difference between Iowa being a top 10 to 15 team versus being the peeps of college football. That's the difference between Petrus coming through this year versus relying on anyone else on that roster. I don't think I've ever had a more violently accurate description of a program and a quarterback situation than that. So that's the spring intel we have for you right now. We'll continue to do that as long as spring camps continue around the country. I didn't talk about LSU there because I want to talk about LSU for a couple of minutes now. LSU is in a really good situation at quarterback, and it does not jive with the perception that many people have of where the LSU program is. So there are going to be some difficult decisions to make up in your mind if you're in a pool or if you're trying to bet futures and you're asking yourself, what should I expect from LSU this year? Do I remember 2019? Do I remember 2020? How in the world do I blend those? It's like oil and water. I don't know what to make of this program. 
They got four guys who could probably start at many programs. They got two guys, I'm talking quarterback, who could start at a vast majority of the programs in America. Now, the two that I'm talking about are Max Johnson, who you saw beat Florida, for example, late in the year. And then you saw Miles Brennan earlier in the season before he got hurt. It was a, an abdomen injury. We never really had public clarification on that. So just as someone who has had an abdomen injury, hey, I couldn't have played quarterback for LSU during my injury either. So I feel Miles Brennan. So guys like Miles Brennan and I, is what I'm trying to say, once we're healthy, maybe we'll contribute. I don't care who starts for him. Like I got a feeling it's a lot more contentious and a lot more competitive than maybe some of, for example, the preview magazines already rolling off the shelves with uh, Miles Brennan penciled in or inked in, I guess is how they have to do it in the magazine world. But look, regardless of who starts, they're in a really good situation here. The quarterback situation at LSU right now and how good it is is why I have a hard time buying into this notion that LSU is some snowball of disaster and it's going to continue to roll downhill. And if you remember how bad they were last year, get ready. That's just a preview of what's to come this year. That's hard to envision for me. I'm not telling you they're going to win the West or win a national title. I'm telling you I got a hard time believing they're not going to be much improved this year. I'm going to ask you, how do they not improve? First off, because of the obvious. Can't get much worse than it was last year. How do they not greatly improve this year? Because even if it's Mac Johnson, or a Mac John, Max Johnson, if it's Mac Johnson, if it's Miles Brennan, like one of those guys is going to be a for sure bona fide SEC caliber quarterback, national caliber quarterback this year. And they have two legit options. That's what's important. They don't have, it's not like at Iowa. It's not Spencer Petrus or Bust. It's Max Johnson, if it ain't him, it's Miles Brennan. You can reverse that order. T.J. Finley has started for him. Garrett Nussmeyer is a true freshman who would start at a lot of places. They're afforded the luxury of not having to start him this year. Doesn't mean they couldn't. They got a new defensive coordinator. They've got talent on both sides, uh, the likes of which 98% of the sport would envy. How in the world do they not improve greatly this year? Ed Orgeron's name is going to be forever linked to one of these guys. He's either going to be linked to Max Johnson. He's going to be linked to Miles Brennan. Now, hopefully, he gets a chance down the road to survive and link his name to the likes of Garrett Nussmeyer. If that happens, Ed Orgeron has staved off any threat of losing his job, and LSU football is back on track. But this is the year. See, because a lot of people cannot see 2022 for Ed Orgeron right now. I think including a lot of people in the administrative side of things at LSU. They're looking right now at 2021, and then the blinders are on. There's a fog past 2021. But his name's going to be linked to one of these guys. You see, because if it's Max Johnson, then Ed Orgeron's going into battle with Max Johnson this year. And everyone at LSU, myself, everyone else is looking around, and they're saying, all right, you won a title in 2019. 2020 was a disaster. If you're a lot more 19 than 20, we'll find out in 21. And we'll find it out because you will have chosen amongst these three or four legitimate options at quarterback, you've chosen the right one. We've got all the talent we need at offense. We got all the talent we need at defense. This roster looks good. You made the coaching changes you say you needed to make. So now let's go into battle and let's win some football games. And whoever that quarterback is, that's who Ed Orgeron is going to be linked to. So who is it going to be? My guess right now is they don't know. My guess right now is maybe even if Ed Orgeron has a lean, not only is he not ready to say it, he doesn't know himself. And that's a good thing, by the way. That's a very good thing. LSU fans, though, my point is it's a win-win for them because they look at this right now, and this is the most enviable position to be in at the most enviable position in sports. If you got in, especially in football, if you've got quarterback figured out, you've got this sport figured out, unless you have just a complete landfill under the topsoil of your program. Now, I know LSU's had some problems down there, but I'm just talking about football for a second. Unless you have complete garbage under the surface, you got quarterback figured out, you got a shot. It's hard to be great to elite at quarterback in college football and lose three or four games. And it's hard to do this year. You got to really screw things up. So I'm looking at LSU this year. Yeah, they got a tough schedule. They do every year. But if one of these guys is right, they'll fix things this year. But let's just say they do have quarterback figured out, but for whatever reason, the rest of the program goes belly up. Well, then you get another staff in there, okay? But my point is, I'm looking at Garrett Nussmeyer. That's who I'm looking at, down the road. Forget this year for a second. Look down the road. LSU's in such a good quarterback position because whether it's Ed Orgeron or someone else in 2023 leading the program, 
you got such a good situation at quarterback that you have cultivated an environment much like North Carolina has with Sam Howell now and Drake May tomorrow. You got either Johnson now and Brennan now and Nussmeyer tomorrow, and who's to say you don't bring in someone more talented than him in this class or the next class? You've got an opportunity to bring really good to elite quarterback play in and then not have to start the guy his first year. That's where you want to be. That's where Bama is with guys like Bryce Young. They did it with Tua. That's where LSU is now. Not to compare those names, apples to apples, but the situations are very comparable. That's why it is hard for me to look at the LSU football program and say, oh, that's a disaster. It's not going to fix itself. Uh, well, I'm telling you right now, if they're struggling to stay above 500 this year, it would surprise me if for no other reason, and that quarterback room will not let it float around 500. Nose itches. All right, let's wrap it up with this. Um, Brad Crawford and a lot of the guys over on the desk at 24-7 Sports, they do a really good job this time of year putting out lists. Lists are everything. Lists in the content creation world are the most time-tested piece of content that there is. Everyone loves lists. And so even if you claim you hate lists, you click on it so you can hate it. So I looked yesterday morning, or, or maybe in this morning, I get my days mixed up, over on the website, 247sports.com, Brad Crawford on 247sports.com put up a list of the 10 spotlight games he's looking at in the SEC this year. Now, this is not my list. I'll probably come up with one a little bit closer to the season. But I found it really interesting because I was scrolling down this list. I had thoughts immediately on every game. And so we'll scroll through these right quick. I'm not going to go too deep on any one game. But I'm going to name the game. I'm going to give you the week. And then you can think right along with me. What comes to your mind immediately? We're not looking to break down position versus position. Just immediately, what comes to mind? How about Ole Miss at Tennessee in week seven? First thing that came to my mind is this stretch that Ole Miss has. I don't know if you've printed off your helmet grid schedule yet. Put it on the fridge. If you haven't, why in the world are you waiting? I, Independence Day is no time to wait for to put your helmet grid schedule up. Do it now. Ole Miss, I want to give you a seven-week stretch that they have to play this year. Alabama, Arkansas, Tennessee, this game, LSU, Auburn, Liberty, which is a top 25 team now, and Texas A&M. That is a seven-week stretch for Ole Miss. No bye weeks. I'm looking at this list, and crazy though it might seem, if we went by 2020 standards, the Tennessee game would be the most winnable game, even including Liberty. The Tennessee game would be the most winnable game. I don't know how 2021 is going to shake out. That's why this is my initial thought on that. How about South Carolina at Georgia? That's a week three game. Will Muschamp obviously comes to the forefront. If you don't know, Muschamp's at Georgia now in a senior analyst role. I'm told Will Muschamp knows the South Carolina roster fairly well. So here's what came to my mind. Now, this would be really, really um, far-reaching in a prediction fashion, but I'm not making a prediction right now. But remember when Lane Kiffin took the Tennessee job? In year one, he had that press conference, and he said, get ready to sing Rocky Top all night long after we beat Florida, because it's going to happen. At the time, Florida was the number one program in America, and they did not beat Florida. But they were a lot more competitive than the 56-14 to 14 final everyone expected. Like, they, they were competitive with Florida. They went to Bama, the eventual national champ that year, and lost 12-10. to 10. And so I'm looking at Shane Beamer in South Carolina this year. I'm not picking them to win any of these games but they're going to be a three-plus touchdown underdog in this situation most likely. What if they were to go in there and put up a 23-16 loss? Well, that would be encouraging. So blowout versus close loss, like I know everyone believes record is everything. Not in year one for a new head coach, at least not for me. Like I think you can glean a lot from how a team loses a game, especially early in a coach's tenure. Five years in, no one cares. You just got to go win. How about A&M at Ole Miss? This is week 11 is so far away, it, it, it does no good. We don't even know which quarterback's going to be healthy or anything like that. But at this point, in week 11, by the time A&M goes to Oxford, they've played Arkansas, they've played Bama, they've played Missouri, they've played Auburn. And then I look at Ole Miss, and I was reading off that stretch of games. This A&M game comes at the very end of that stretch. Again, they play Bama, Arkansas, Tennessee, LSU, Auburn, Liberty, and then A&M. They could be 8-1. and one, They could be 4-5. and five. I could see both scenarios very easily playing out. But this is that kind of game where we're going to learn a lot. Well, we will have already learned. We will have further validation of whether the A&M offensive machine has taken the steps it needs to take. 
because they could grind out wins against inferior teams with inferior offenses. But even if Ole Miss is perceived or in reality is an inferior team to A&M, they better be able to score. Because you see, Ole Miss was inferior to Alabama last year, if I remember correctly. They still hung 48 on Alabama. Now, Bama could score in the low 60s, so it didn't matter. Can A&M do that? I don't know. We'll see this year. Maybe we'll see. The Iron Bowl is the last week of the regular season, so it's week 13. Bama at Auburn. Any, if they play at, at Bryant-Denny Stadium, it's just about matchup for me. But when Georgia and Bama, when they go into Auburn, the, the venue always plays a role. I can't quantify this for you. I'm just telling you I've been on the field many times for these games at Auburn. Just different. Can't explain it. I used to think it was BS before I experienced it. It's not. There's something real. Don't know what it is that happens there. Uh, I'm not going to go as far as to say haunted, cursed, spell, anything like that. But I'm also not discounting that as a possibility. So we wonder, because I've watched many a time Auburn be a sizable underdog there. Doesn't end up that way. They could lose. Doesn't end up as any kind of blowout or anything like that. This is Brian Harson's first Iron Bowl. So that's the second thing that I thought. And the third thing, I think, because this is the last game of the regular season, is I wonder what Bama looks like at that point. They're going to be a, a prohibitive favorite to win the SEC West. Okay. Uh, that's happened before, and they've not won the West. So is it going to be a must-win game for them? in terms of the SEC, in terms of the playoff, could they be in a cushion situation where we're looking at it and we're saying they need to win if they want to keep the number one seed, but hey, they could probably afford to lose. They'll still go to Atlanta. They can still do yada, yada, yada. That's what I think about with that one. How about Georgia at Auburn? This is week six. Again, this is the year, that, that odd number year, where Auburn gets both Bama and Georgia at home. Auburn's got to go to LSU the week before. So this is one of those baptism by fire stretches for Brian Harson. Wonder what Bo Nix will look like. Because this isn't week one or week two. So this is halfway through the year. And this is a very crucial two-game stretch for the Tigers. Georgia, you've looked at their schedule. And if you haven't, you will. And you'll say, oh, they open with Clemson. This is going to be a tough year. And then you go, huh, wait a second. I see they play Florida way down the line here. But where, how many other losable games do they have? And then it's going to occur to you, oh, the Auburn game, the game at Auburn. That may be the next most losable game they have. They play Arkansas the week before, but that's in Athens. And so that's kind of what pops in my mind is how losable will this game seem when we get there? Because right now you'd favor Georgia by 10 points or so, I would guess, maybe more, if they were playing at Auburn today, but they're not playing there today. So JT Daniels, it's going to be one of a couple of prove-it games for him too at Georgia. LSU at Bama is a lot of times the circle game of the year in the SEC. This is week 10. I guess it's kind of on LSU to determine whether that's going to be the case this year. It'll be the season for them. I mean, that, that's pretty straightforward. I don't think much more needs to be said because we'll say a lot more when the game gets here. How about Bama at Florida? Do you know this game's happening this year? It is. And it's early in the year. Alabama plays at Florida week three. History tells us one thing about trying to upset Nick Saban. And trying to upset Nick Saban has to involve a precision passing effort. And they're not going to have that in all likelihood at Florida this year. So how do they pull the upset off? That was the thought. And it's not going away anytime soon. Bryce Young, unless Miami steps up their effort in week one, this will probably be his toughest early season test. And speaking of Miami, I mentioned them because Bama plays Miami in week one. Then they play Florida in week three. If you're interested in that whole Florida in-state team compared to other team dynamic, even if they're not in the same conference, we'll get a really, really good cross data set because we'll have Florida and Miami already with a common opponent after week three. Now, it'll be one of the best teams in the country, but we'll still be able to see that. If Bama goes 33-23 against Miami and then goes 50-10 to against Florida, well, that indicates a little something, I guess. And then lastly, got a couple of them here that... I, I would guess are the games of the year, at least as we sit right now. Georgia, Florida, the neutral site in Jacksonville, much to the chagrin of some of our viewers, as I found out. Week nine, this will define JT Daniels' legacy at Georgia. Don't think it's too soon to say that. Uh, the SEC East may be on the line there, but the playoff could also be on the line. JT Daniels' legacy. Didn't start this game last year, started after it. And then everyone was left saying in the offseason, up to and including now, what if he had played in that game? We lost the game by X number of points. What if he had played in that game? Could we have matched points? Could he have matched production with Kyle Trask? Could we have traded points with Florida? Well, you get your shot this year. And you get it again 
presumably, if it is Daniels versus Emory Jones, with the quarterback edge on the side of Georgia. That's how it seems in April. We'll see if it plays out that way. And Alabama goes to College Station, Texas in week six, Bama at a and I'm interested in two things. How comparable or how closer to comparable does the a and roster look to Alabama? And then what's the quarterback situation? Because you're going to have a couple of first-year starters. We think Bryce Young for Alabama. You think Haynes King for Texas A&M. Again, it's not week one or two. It's halfway through the year. So whatever these teams are offensively, whoever these quarterbacks are, they will be that version, that incarnation of themselves by the time these two teams play. It's going to be a fun year. Always is. Hopefully we get a full year. Hopefully some folks can actually be in person to witness these games. But those are the ones that we're looking forward to as laid out by our Brad Crawford in the SEC this year. Really appreciate you watching. Again, if you want to schedule a Zoom consultation, hit me up, joshpate706 at gmail.com. If you want in on the Late Kick Show Owners Association meeting coming up very soon, you can DM me on Instagram or Twitter, at Late Kick Josh. Should be following me there anyway. We do a lot there we don't do on the show. Or email me, again, joshpate706 at gmail.com. We'll enter your name into the lottery. We'll let you know Sunday night or Monday morning who's going to be involved in that. We're going to have more people because we're going to have a different format this time. Uh, it's going to be a lot cleaner. Uh, it's going to probably have a lot more back and forth. We learned a lot of lessons. Director Colin and I, when we chopped that thing up last time, we had a scroll. And we just rolled it out, and we want to do this, 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 and this. We don't want to do that, 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 and that. So it's going to be really fun. Hope you can be a part of it. Uh, so good luck in the lottery. We already got a lot of names. We'll be well into the hundreds, if not thousands. And so you guys liked that last time. I think you'll like it even more this time. Thank you so much for joining us. For Director Emeritus Colin, for Jesse and the entire crew in Connecticut, I'm Josh Pate. Thanks so much for watching. Have a great start to your weekend. Enjoy the Masters. We'll be back here right after that Sunday night. Until then, God bless.